Hello! In this video, I am going to try to model for you some concise writing, and I'm going to talk through some of the decisions that I'm making as I do this so that you have a better sense of what to look for when you're editing your own writing. It is, I should say, a little bit easier to edit someone else's writing for conciseness because often when we are editing our own, it feels like every word is necessary but it's usually not true. I've said this many times, but the idea that the more distance you have in time between when you wrote the piece and when you edit it increases the likelihood that you'll be able to identify the places that don't sound right where you could do some more work. So I'm gonna to try to show you what that process looks like um, during this video. I'm gonna be doing most of my modeling by using suggesting mode in Google Docs. So it's outside of my screen capture area now, but I'm going over to that little pencil button and I'm clicking where it says editing and I'm turning it into suggesting. And what that's gonna do is highlight for you all the changes that I made so you can see them as I work. What I did for this was I just went through quite a few student essays and looked for passages, sentences, a, a couple of sentences that I thought could be more concise. And so if you see yours here, try not to take it personally. Um, even if you didn't actually volunteer to be in the video, I have removed all identifying information and I think I've got a you know variety of types of issues represented, although we probably will see some of the same problems repeated multiple times because that is what happens. Um, there are certain patterns that occur in writing and that's actually helpful because that helps us know better what to look for. All right, so let's start with the first one I have here. Martin Luther King Jr. So this comes from, these come from student text analyses and there were three different texts they were writing about. So I realized that viewers don't have the context in which these appear. So you're gonna to have to just trust me when I say something is redundant because of context. Martin Luther King Jr. emphasized the shared value of religion between blacks and whites in order for the audience to understand and realize that he is also religious and aims to comply with their religious beliefs. Okay, uh, the first thing I wanna do is not related to conciseness, but I need to fix this, present tense verbs. Okay, the first place that stands out to me is this, to understand and realize. Those verbs aren't exactly the same, but they're definitely similar enough that we don't need them both. This is an example of redundancy, where you're repeating information that you don't need to say again. Um, so pick one. It kind of doesn't matter which one, you pick the one that you like the best. So I'm just gonna go with understand. Now let's come back and look at some slightly more complicated um, issues. Okay, in this word shared, there's a lot going on that we can unpack. The word shared implies quite a bit of information. And while it is best to be cautious and always tell the reader exactly what you want them to understand, at the same time, if we shove too much information in there, we risk distracting the reader and having them lose focus on what really matters and what we're saying. So I think it is safe to say, because of the context of this essay and of the piece that's being analyzed, that we don't need to say it's the shared value of religion between blacks and whites. I think we can allow who it's between to be implied. Okay, then in order for the audience to understand that he is also religious and aims to comply with their religious beliefs. So another signal that we could rewrite something is when we're repeating words. So I've got religion, religious, and religious. And there are several things that could mean. That could mean I could combine information to eliminate unnecessary repetition. It might mean that this is a prime place for parallel structure. Um, but what I think is happening here is that we actually need to take some of these clauses and turn them into phrases. And that's a lot of what conciseness work involves, is turning clauses into phrases and phrases into single words. So what I suggest here 
is that we actually change this. He is also religious indicates that he shares that value as well. So I'm going to say the religious values instead of values of religion. Did I spell that wrong? Yes. The religious values that he shares with his audience in order to, um, there are a couple of things we could do here. We could say in order to help them understand and then whatever it is they're understanding. But I'm not going to do that yet because what I think is happening here is that we're unclear about why he's doing it. What does this mean? He wants, he aims to comply with their religious beliefs. What is that? What is he really doing that for? Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, the context of the essay, that this is really about getting the, his audience to trust him. And so instead of saying, in order for the audience to, to understand that he is also religious, which we're going to get rid of anyway, um, we're going to get rid of this whole thing and say, in order to increase his credibility. Okay. Martin Luther King Jr. emphasizes the religious values that he shares with his audience in order to increase his credibility. If we look at the next sentence, King achieves this by establishing his ethos. I don't think we need this. Um, we could just get into, first of all, now I've got increases credibility. That repeats, that's repeated here. So now I'm going to change this. Um, so what's actually important, if we keep going in this sentence, his piousness and religious background and comparing himself to religious icons to fight against segregation, giving the audience a reason to accept direct action. Again, we have religious again and again and again. So even piousness is a word for religious. So we're going to cut a lot of that out. First, we're going to start the sentence with a prep phrase. We're getting rid of the king achieves this so that we're not starting the sentence in the same way as we did the previous one. So by, and then instead of saying establishing his ethos, because we already talked about that. Another problem here, just to pause for a moment, I see this quite a bit in these essays. We've got a lot of prep phrases piling up on each other by establishing his ethos, by demonstrating his piousness. Like that's very confusing for readers to follow. What is the how? What is the by? Pick one, be clear and specific about it. So we already did this by demonstrating his, I think religious background can imply piousness. So let's just say by demonstrating his, religious background and comparing himself to religious icons. Now, here's my question. I don't remember. Does the writer of this essay mean to, the, he, this is to, he compares the, the two fight is, who's doing the fighting against segregation, King or the religious icons? Um, if it's King, then this phrase needs to go somewhere else. It doesn't belong here. I'm going to say it's the religious icons just for sake of argument. So let's change this to who have fought against segregation. So by demonstrating his religious background to comparing himself to religious icons who have fought against segregation, he gives the audience a reason to accept direct action. Okay. So again, let's, let's kind of review. We took away redundancies. We really thought about the pre what precisely it is we're trying to say. And we said just that. I think often what happens is in writing that's, not, that's really wordy or I'm having trouble following it, it's because the writer isn't exactly sure what they want to say. And so they put a lot of information in, but they don't go back to figure out, okay, what is it that I really am trying to say? And that's a really important part of this process, because when you were writing, you were writing for an audience. You're trying to communicate to someone else. 
All right, let's move on to another one. That one took a while. King starts off his letter with a response to the criticism by introducing his reasons for being in Birmingham. In the beginning of his letter, King creates a genial and coherent tone as he refers to the clergyman as men of genuine goodwill. which leads him to write that his response will be reasonable. Okay, so one of the things we can do to make our writing more concise is to choose stronger action verbs. So starts off, um, a better word is begins. That's what I'm gonna say for the moment anyway. I might change that later depending on where we go, but that's just to illustrate finding the better verb. Begins his letter with a response to the criticism by introducing his reasons for being in Birmingham. <sighs> okay, again, we're seeing a lot of prep phrases building on each other, and that gets very confusing for the reader to follow, especially when they aren't placed where they need to be placed. Um, so I think maybe even better than begins, the real action here is this, is the responding. This is something I see a lot in the student writing is that we tend to bury the actions and we choose weak verbs. So one of the things we can do to make our writing much better pretty quickly is to look at a sentence, find what the actual action is and make that the verb. So let's do this. King first responds to the criticism. What criticism? This we actually need another word. The clergyman's criticism by introducing his reasons for being in Birmingham. And I might say, instead of introducing, clarifying, maybe stating his reasons for being in Birmingham in the beginning of his letter. Okay. But we've already said it's the beginning. So we don't need this at all. King creates a genial and coherent tone as he refers to the clergyman as men of genuine goodwill, which leads him to write that his response will be reasonable. So again, we've got, now we've got a lot of clauses building on each other. What's important here? Referring to the clergyman as men of genuine goodwill is probably what's most important. So let's say I'm going to move the comma to the inside of the quotation marks because that is what we are supposed to do. It's kind of the rule um, in American writing. That's the way we do it. By referring to the clergyman as men of genuine goodwill, what does that do? What is his purpose in doing that? He, I always forget, I have to write this outside of what I deleted. He increases the likelihood that they will listen to the rest of his argument. Now that sentence might need another you might need another a separate sentence of explanation after that. Why would that make them more likely to listen to his argument? Well, it's in part because he's complimenting them. He's saying, you know, I believe that you have good morals and values. And so if he says that about them, rather than attacking them, they're more likely to, to listen, even though they know that there's going to be a little bit of antagonism in the letter. All right, let's do the next one. In that current time period, the North and South are very much against each other regarding beliefs and values. However, Lincoln needs the North to become more accepting of the South due to the expected reunion of the nation. Additionally, he emphasizes that he knows as much as his audience does about the war in order to create a trust between him and his audience. So the first thing that stands out is this, in that current time period. I feel like current time period, those words all are too similar to each other. So we don't need all three of them. Let's just say during 
we're going to assume context already told us what the time is. It's the Civil War. The North and the South are very much against each other regarding beliefs and values. Okay, another thing that we need to do to make our writing more concise is to get rid of unhelpful modifiers, which often are adverbs. Just cut them. Um, you don't need them. So instead of are very much against each other, what's really happening here? What's the important action against each other? Okay, um, the North and South have opposing beliefs and values. And we probably better say regarding slavery because they don't have totally opposing beliefs and values. It's context specific. You also may just have noticed that I turned this comma into a semicolon. And I did that because this is a complete sentence. And what comes after it is a complete sentence, which means that you cannot join those two things with a comma only. You have to use a semicolon. You could do a period in a new sentence. However, many people, especially those who are a little bit more conservative, don't like it when people start sentences with however. So it's a little bit safer to do the semicolon however comma. Okay, so let's see the content here. However, Lincoln needs the North to become more accepting of the South due to the expected reunion of the nation. Again, too many prep phrases. I think we might be better off shifting the emphasis here. Um, let's make this a subordinate clause at the beginning of the sentence. Because the end goal of war is reunification, Lincoln needs the North to become more accepting of the South. If I'm being really aggressive in my conciseness, I might get rid of this and say needs the North to accept the South. However, if the writer wants to emphasize the process, that so this is a slow process that's unfolding over time, then the becoming is probably more accurate. <clears throat> okay, additionally, he emphasizes that he knows as much as his audience does about the war in order to create a trust between him and the audience. So this is kind of like the one of the previous examples where we're seeing the repetition of certain words over and over again. He is being repeated multiple times, and so is audience. So to get rid of that, we need to restructure it. Um, he and I mean, uh, let's just say emphasizes is the right word. It might not be, but we'll leave it. He emphasizes that he and his audience. have equal knowledge about the war in order to, instead of this, the better word is to increase his credibility. We're actually, I've noticed um, we're seeing this idea of increasing credibility in a lot of these paragraphs. And I think that's because I pulled almost all of these paragraphs from introductions just for my own time. Um, so if you're noticing that, it's merely a coincidence all right, this is gonna be the last one for this particular video and lesson. Frederick Douglass wrote his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass in 1845, shortly after he was freed from slavery with the intent of destroying slavery, an institution that had, uh, we've got just like a little mistake here, that had scarred him and caused him an immense amount of pain. So first thing I might do, uh, maybe a little, it's a little bit aggressive, but, I don't know if we need that. If narrative is italicized, <clears throat> especially depending on the context of the paragraph, we don't need to say that because, sorry, to say the rest of the title here because we know it's his narrative. Frederick Douglass wrote his narrative in 1845, shortly after he, and this is actually an important distinction, he wasn't freed, he escaped. With the intent of destroying slavery, an institution that had scarred him and caused him immense amount of pain. I would, well, okay, you can do a couple of things. There's a lot of ideas piling up here. There's a chance the reader's going to get lost. So you could separate the sentences here. If you really want to keep it one sentence, with the intent of destroying slavery, an institution that had scarred him. Okay, so here though, scarring him and causing him immense pain are very similar ideas. 
So I'm gutting this because scarring is not only more concise, but it's also more vivid. Okay. Douglas appeals to his mostly white northern audience who are ignorant to the brutality, I would say ignorant of, just idiomatically, the brutality of slavery by narrating a scenario in which slaves are ranked with animals and property in order to be valued and split up among the heir of a recently deceased slave, diseased, maybe it means deceased. Um, we're going to cut that part anyway. There's too many, again, it's mostly prep phrases by narrowing scenario in which slaves are ranked with, with animals and property in order to be valued and split up among the heir of a recently deceased slave owner. Okay, um, this part is important because it's telling us about the beliefs and values of the audience, so we're going to keep it. By narrating a scenario in which slaved, slaves are ranked... with animals and property in order to be valued and split up. All right, I think we don't need this period. I think it's just, we don't need that. I don't think if I remember the context of the passage correctly. What's more important is the comparison, I'm assuming, between the slaves being compared to animals. Okay. Frederick Douglass accomplishes his purpose of changing his audience's belief to understanding the dehumanizing nature of slavery by demonstrating the effect of slavery on slave owners through his use of description and narrative, highlighting a degrading scene where slaves are compared to animals with his use of syntax and organization and utilizing tone to evoke pathos from the audience when illustrating the deep sadness of the slaves. I hope you could hear how challenging that sentence is to read. Lots of phrases, really too much content, um, too much thesis statements are usually complex sentences, but not convoluted sentences. So we want to be really meticulous about thinking about what exactly it is we want to say. Okay. So I'm going to focus in on what's important. The dehumanizing nature of slavery is probably important. I probably want to keep that somehow. I'm going to highlight it actually. So I remember that. Um, by demonstrating the effect of slavery on slave owners through his description and narrative. So I'm already, I'm not. I'm confused by what scene this writer is focusing on. We've got a scene where slaves are compared to animals. We've got the sadness of the slaves. We've got the effect of slavery on slave owners. It doesn't even sound like one specific passage to me. Um, Frederick Douglass, here we go, magic conveys the dehumanizing nature of slavery. The rest of that accomplishes its purpose of changing his audience beliefs to understanding. It's all implied that if he that if he's conveying it, it's to an audience. And what's the purpose? He wants them to understand the dehumanizing nature of slavery. Conveys the dehumanizing nature of slavery by demonstrating the effect of slavery on slave owners. So if it's this through his use of description, then that's the verb. The effect of slavery on slave owners. Um, highlighting a degrading scene where slaves are compared to animals. By describing the effect of slavery on slave owners. Maybe it's as well by describing the effect of slavery on slave owners and comparing animals, sorry, and comparing slaves to animals. Okay, so what I have done is I've basically gotten rid of, there's a lot of words in here that are important to analysis, description, narration, or methods of development, comparisons, method of development, syntax, and organization. When you talk about tone, pathos, 
but it's all too much for the thesis. In your thesis, you really only need one answer to the question of how, and it should be the broadest how possible. It should really be your umbrella technique. The ideas about syntax and organization and tone and pathos, those should all be pulled into your analysis itself. They should not be separate focal points of the essay that get their own paragraphs. <clears throat> the other thing I want to point out here is just his, the, his use. Um, I noted this in a lot of the essays where people are saying his, you know, his use of, and we talked about not doing that. What you do is what I just did. You take whatever the technique is and you make it the verb, or you make it here, it's really um, part of a prep phrase, which you can do as well, through striking syntax, if that's really what the main idea is. There are quite a few different ways to write it, but the main Key, the key to this is finding the main action of a sentence and making that the verb and cutting the rest. Cho if you choose stronger words, they're going to do more work for you. It's kind of like when you're eating and you decide, you're deciding between whether or not you're going to have a bagel for lunch or a salad. And let's just say for sake of argument, they both have 500 calories, okay? Um, but what those calories in the salad, especially if it's a salad that has a lot of different vegetables in it and some different kinds of protein, that salad has a lot of nutrients that are doing a lot of work for your body. Whereas the bagel, as delicious as it might be, does not. Um, it is a choice that is not helping your body do the hard work that it needs to do as well as it could. And it's kind of the same thing with language. Um, you have to pick the words that are going to do more work for you, like the nutrient dense words, the words that have really clear, specific meaning. So you don't have to put in a ton of phrases and clauses. All right, this has gone on long enough. I hope it was helpful. I'll talk to you later.